I'm so really, really, really glad to have our second book launch. Um, this feels really cool. And today we have Amelia Gorman. And Amelia, every time I read your name, I think of um, the poet Amanda yo, Gorman. Yo. <laughs> I got a few messages about that. And, and I'm like, and oh. she's like astoundingly talented. So I certainly yes. don't mind people having those correlations in their head. It is really funny because like, I'm like, no, Amelia, Amelia, like I have to like tell myself and it's such a compliment because she's lovely. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, so today we're going to have Amelia read a little bit um, from her new book release that came out this week, Field Guide to Invasive Species of Minnesota. Um, and this is one that I was so, so excited to be able to accept because the second I read it out of the slush pile, I was like, I want to do the pictures on the inside. <laughs> like I knew immediately that this is what, <laughs> and then I was so glad that you let me do it. Um, you know, so this is a super special book because, you know, it's illustrated and we took the illustrations from um, the actual like old school field guides. Um, so there was a lot of like work on that end that I'm really proud of. And thank you for letting me do that, Amelia. Um, and so Amelia is one of my favorite speculative, speculative poets. Um, and you have published a good number of poems and also some short stories, right? Um, and mm -hmm. what I love about your work is this sort of like dedication to nature and, you know, um, I think nature poetry, and I think a lot of people think like that's sort of like maybe this old school dull thing and you make it really fascinating yeah. <laughs> and really creepy and awesome. Um, and I really appreciate that. So I'm gonna let a couple more people in here. Oh, look at all these people coming in late. Nice. late. Um, yeah, I and know these people here they come. <laughs> hey, oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh! See, it's the like five oh four rush, of right? Um, Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and so, Amelia, I'm just, I'm just super stoked about this little book, and you know, really excited to hear you read from it, and I really appreciate, you know, you letting us go to town on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, um, I, we're going to go ahead and just let you read now. Um, and there will be okay. time near the end for questions. And that's about it. Take it away. Okay. Great. Um, I'm going to start by saying it was definitely wonderful for me to have you um, want to make such a beautiful book with with the illustrations, um, with the kind of old field guide illustrations. A while ago, I watched a lecture that talked about how um, scientific illustrations have always kind of affected or been influenced by the anxiety of the age they're written in. Um, so I'm not sure what that says about my book, but, but I do think it adds a lot to it, um, a lot to the kind of emotional points I hope I make. And um, I'll start reading. Okay, this is a uh, zebra muscle. This twisting pass from delta downwards holds the little purses, invasive, clasped to their cliff sides, anchored with bissel threads and fed by probing feet. I, the ragged bounty hunter, pocketing the mirrored shells. A chum bucket of zebra mussels earns you an extra ration from the DNR. The little hitchhikers come in from the polar seas Desperate for Minnesota's tepid new latitudes, I do my civic duty gathering bivalves for a job recommendation, an unemployment extension, even just a Sunday afternoon spent with finger-long fry sunnies with emerging legs, loons that lost theirs some year along the way. On my way home, two fishers with metal teeth grab a snapping turtle by its furred scruff, like I might have my mean old cat before he dried up and blew away in the wind. Look what we caught. I slow to watch the weirdness and how when they crack off the shell, pearls fall from the crevice, now shattered into a glistening two-shelled organism, 
that isn't where they come from. I try to remember the way the world is supposed to work, sputtering past basalt bluffs and shining rainbows of knacker strings, dead lights, Cambrian, past a dead raccoon, pearls spilling out its guts, sliding on white ball bearings. That is a mid-spring oil planing. I skid into the dark and wonder what world I'm entering and what hot hell I'm leaving behind, thrilled at the thought of what's growing inside me. So this is the last poem in the book because uh, as a field guide, they're properly alphabetically ordered, but it was the first one I wrote. And the, the working title originally was Field Guide to Invasive Species of the Mississippi colon zebra mussel. That's the poem. Uh, and then I'm like, you know, I could write another one. And I wrote it about, I believe, uh, Queen Anne's Lace and I realized I couldn't call it the Mississippi then, uh, so I switched it to Minnesota, but those were still just the poem titles. And just more and more, like when I had kind of writer's block, I would come back to writing these invasive species poem until I realized, oh, wow, like I have enough to apparently fill a whole chapbook. <laughs> um, so this next one is called Walnut Twig Beetle. No one dies of thousand cankers disease. No one but trees, my doctor said. You're not a tree, are you? Not last time I checked, but I've been eating beetles since the crops died and the basement with the preserves flooded and the DNR stopped giving cash for clams and more than my stomach went hollow. They used to say black walnuts poisoned every ground they touched, but at least they were edible. What poisons the poisoners? I can't walk to the clinic anymore. My feet full of holes, like cigarette burns. My knees like joinery, waiting for joints. My face, taking comfort, pressed against the cool of the heavy walnut dining table while a hole riddles my heart. Um, so invasive species, a uh, brief like sort of scientific intro are just any species kind of introduced that outcompetes um, other species, overpopulates itself to the detriment of its of the environment it's in. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of problems with this. Um, I like to uh, kind of blend the real and the imaginary in my poems, but, but of course the walnut twig beetle is real and thousand canker's disease is real. And when a, a single species, species creates a, a monocultural environment, disease can spread a lot faster, which is one of the many ways um, this is a problem. Uh, for example, a native prairie might have a hundred species in a little like one meter block. Uh, whereas when you have one species in the same meter block, uh, disease is just going to cut through it. So, so that's uh, some of the ecology that inspired these poems. Um, and this one is Norway Maple. How funny. My name is Samara, just like your favorite tree. How funny. I grew up across the street from you and the paper mill. It closed before I could work there. Now you and I tolerate pollution as well as the trees. It's only a few tar spots on our lungs, felt gall on our skin. Platitudes won't kindle fires, but heartwood will after we take out the swine. We'll tell stories about the Crimson King, his adventures with Schwedlery and Drummondy and the pendulum. We'll learn dead hobbies like turnery and touching. We'll get drunk on Norway syrup all winter. It isn't sweet like the sugar maple. No, it's something better. Um, here is not related to this poem, but one of my absolute kind of favorite anecdotes about invasive species is from the 1890s. And a man named Eugene Schieffelin uh, wanted to release birds, every bird mentioned in Shakespeare's work into New York. 
because apparently this was a good idea at the time. There were acclimatization societies who thought it would be great to just sort of let different plants and animals out in different, different environments. Um, so he released something like 200 starlings into New York City. Um, there are now about 200 million starlings in the US, often to the, the um, damage to other, other bird species, other native bird species that would live in a more balanced ecosystem. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, that's all I got is Eugene Schieffelin was a weird guy and, uh, and starlings are a problem. Uh, next poem, uh, this one is kind of weird because I think if I were doing this reading a year ago, uh, or a year from now, I might not have included, like, pick this poem to read from the book, even though I really like it. Um, but I think that there are some similarities to the COVID pandemic that made it more appealing right now. So this one is Grecian foxglove. What good is foxglove now that we've removed our bodies We've gotten away from the grind, the gore, and the rats, and the crowds, the electrical storms, the exploding transformers, the rising waters, and death riding war into the mall. In Mother Hutton Hall, we digitize ourselves, subtract the charcoal lungs and the sloughing skin, but the skipping hearts still transfer binary. The defects run straight through our code. Can we save the digitalis on disc too? Love is treatment, flowers kind. Hoaxes are the oldest medicine we know. Um, so there's a record of an old, old herbalist woman named Mother Hutton from Shropshire, England, who recommended purple fox, foxglove uh, as a medicine for a number of conditions and supposedly told a well-known well-known physician um, of the time of the late 1700s. And he you know, interviewed her and, and learned her knowledge and applied it. Um, this is completely fake. Mother Hutton was made up in 1920 to sell Digitalis um, as a, a marketing gimmick. And, and looking through these poems recently, I was struck like this is very frustrating that we're still kind of fighting this disinformation, we're still fighting gimmickry over science. Um, we're still fighting hoaxes, even, even in the middle of a pandemic. And, and in my near future kind of climate apocalypse, we are apparently still fighting hoaxes, but I like to think that there will someday be a time that we can get past that. Uh, I'm probably reading these just, just way too fast. <laughs> but uh, the next poem up is Starry Stone Warts. Um, those of you who like horoscopes, uh, one of my favorite kinds of, of hoaxes, uh, certainly one of the most beautiful. So here's the zodiac astrological signs of the future as found in constellations and starry stonework. Um, horoscope for the week of, let's say today, 9, 8, 2021. Um, the mycoheterotroph. You will be hungry, but it's a familiar hunger. You can find pictures of food, if not food. Frostbite. The stonework sees a deceiving week. Lost days, lost electricity and clean water. Watch out for the rash that comes from bathing in the lake. It burns like ice. Erosion. The stonewort wishes you well, but warns you of the worst. Huge loss is inevitable, but you'll be lighter afterwards. Two-headed. Those born under the sign of the two-headed should avoid the sky today. Casino. Drown your enemies before they drown you. Bottle the memories of your friends. Don't lose a single drop. Little Fisher. 
Beware of parasites and other thoughts that burrow too deep to remove. Acid rain. The succulent stars see travel in your future. Water flowing upriver instead of down. The gateway. The moon's reflection floats through your sign. If you can catch it and drink it, you'll have good luck. Nod. Indications of progeny. Beware teratogens and mountebanks. The march. Malefic planets bring disaster winds. Fortify your house, bar the doors, better not to have windows at all. Moss house, luminaries in this sign bring riches, canned goods, winter wheat harvest and red berries. Warp, you will be nervous, you will have the shakes, you will shiver under fever blankets. If you persevere, you will gain the world. Um, I am going to show the illustration for this one because it's definitely one of my my favorites. I, don't know. <laughs> I think it's just a absolutely gorgeous plant, which is is interesting. And part of why I want to talk about these is it's easy to talk about bad plants and good plants in in landscaping and in conservation, um, but of course there aren't bad plants and good plants. It's it's more like there are bad ecosystems and good ecosystems. Um, and like each one of these plants and animals are certainly fascinating um, in their own right. It's, it's the damage they cause in a, a monocultural system that, that leads to problems. Um, a current one right now is uh, everyone knows California is struggling with a lot more wildfires than usual. And these are, are one of the contributing factors to wildfires. Um, plants that grow too fast, take over the undergrowth and then leave a lot of, of dead waste, um, will burn and uh, provide fuel for fires in a way that a healthy native ecosystem wouldn't. So these are very personal um, and I think very important to talk about the, the conservation and the science behind some of these topics. Um, so with that in mind, <laughs> I'm going to read Earthworms. Well, cities crumble, we clasp, cast to cast, enough of us even in them to come up worms. Million mother, vertical father, dumped as so much half bait into brown lakes, algae stained by motors who had no faith in our resurrection dropped in water, in soil, in swamp and concrete. Underneath the collapse, we entwine. Below the yellow air and lead, we filter yesterday's filth, squeezing out our statues and bringing them to life. Demi-sister, half-brother, sculptor mother, dirt father. Um. This is one of my favorite poems in the whole book, probably because it has a very kind of horror, cosmic horror element to it, uh, which is one of my favorite genres. Uh, the other is that earthworms are kind of fascinating, I think, in the way that they're constantly just making new little, little statues of themselves with their worm casts. Um, and then in a more meaningful way, uh, one thing I wanted to do with this book was maybe address some some kind of bad myths, some false ideas we all have. Because these poems are, are sometimes based in science, but they're certainly not scientific. So if there is a real kind of scientific value in them, I would like it to be shooting down some of these bad myths. Um, one of those bad myths is that earthworms are good for gardens. We all say this, we all have heard it, you know, from our parents and our grandparents. Uh, and they are to some extent good for gardens, but they aren't necessarily good for ecosystems. If they upset soil in a way that, that native plants aren't used to, they can, they can cause huge problems. Um, another bad myth. If I could add one poem to this book, it would probably be the invasive honeybee. Because another bad myth is that um, honeybees are in trouble or, you know, there's truth that we do need to preserve pollinators, but honeybees are at an all-time high. 
population. Uh, what we need to do is preserve flies and, and sweat bees and silver bees and ground bees and all these more unpopular bugs. Uh, <laughs> so, so over and over again, like if there's um, a point to kind of telling new myths and making new myths, I think it should be to eradicate some of these bad myths that have taken over gotten sort of misinterpreted even when they're coming from a good place. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to read Trapdoor Snail. After the acidification of 2044 CE, there was still no fathoming the waters. Cloudy life, algae, fading secchi disks, fish scales hiding something bottomless from us deeper than the fauché, the witch's hat, or the steps tower. Out of that endless hole they came, escaping the clarity that was death for want of oxygen. Regal, slimy, and glistening, 12 yellow grubs on all their shells. She was the only one who wanted to discard the mother of pearl and wrap her tongue into legs. Change isn't hard in these times, but people touched her like knives. Knives, operettas, and brine in your eyes until she wished her body was made out of sea foam and could cloud the waters again. Um, I love water so much. I love lakes and the ocean and, and rivers. Um, I love swimming and, and hiking and just looking at it. And part of what I love is they're so uh, non-sterile, is a healthy body of water, there'll be so many little fish biting your feet or, um, or so many bugs or, <laughs> or weird little clams, or you look at the sand and it's all different kinds of shells. And um, a lot of my favorite places to go in Minnesota, you can definitely sort of slowly see the damage being done by things like the trapdoor snail and the zebra mussel um, you don't see the same kind of diversity of, of fish and of life that you used to. And I, I believe someone who had some very nice words to say about my book, um, where is it? John Philip Johnson wrote, some hideous things called zebra mussels showed up in the water and somehow seemed to ruin everything. <laughs> and it's, you know, realizing that lots of people are having this experience of seeing these special places to them be, be damaged. Okay, um, this one is Mute Swan. There is no fathoming these waters. You're the cello in this piece? I was a cello too. Let's speak in music instead and splash pianos on each other. There is one fathoming of these waters. Buttons sink from my shirt before a dive when learning two things about breaking men's legs. There are two fathoming these waters, then wings, half this lake for you and half for me, love. Uh, so swans, like a lot of a lot of plants and some animals, were were introduced in such a kind of I don't know um, capitalist not capitalist way, but this just conspicuous consumption of rich people, this desire to to beautify in a very specific way. And like Holly said uh, when she introduced me. Like, oh, there's often this attitude that nature poetry is old fashioned. Um, I recently read a review of a book of pandemic poems that talked about how no one should write a poem about trees. <laughs> um, we should only write, you know, we should be more interested in working class poems, not poems about trees. But, but I think these are working class poems. And I think, you know, where I live right now, trees are very much a working class topic. Um, with the, the history of the lumber industry, with the fact that people come from all over the world to see the trees where I live. Um, I live by a bunch of old growth redwoods. That, that nature poetry 
is still important, it's still modern, and it is still happening. And the last poem I'm going to read from the book for now is Brittle Nyad. So, brittle as the snow is gray, she has secrets for one who will listen. We all miss the old world. Being can count as an action at four meters fathom, she whispers. There is nothing safe about houses. Submerged Sybil of the Mississippi. One day a year, she rises, saying, harvesting is hard for roots unwoven. Oracle, nautical, tells the traveler in noxious tones. Men drown when you choke their machines. Boats beach themselves in the storms on her winter shores. Sinking is its own reward. Ice ghosts decay along the flows, and breaking is its own survival strategy. Um, and then I have one thing I'm going to read that's not in the book because as a sort of counterpoint to this book, I've toyed with the idea of, of writing a field guide to native plants of California, um, it may be in a more hopeful way. And here's the sort of first, first poem in that series. Um, this is from Field Guide to Imaginary Species of California, Slimy Tassel. Courtship makes you in a mirror, dangles you by one leg from the bloom on bloom bracts. You braced a slug on the end of a pendant catkin. But beside you, your eyes stalk the horizon asking, where's the wind on this stagnant day? Asking for wet on wet on wet, asking a gust to swing you, rooted, knives out against the mirror. Um. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop with poems for now and look at some of these questions, I guess. That was great, thank you. <laughs> oh, and I'd like to actually say the last one I read, uh, I hope it's okay to show, a friend of mine did some beautiful art that we've been like messing around with some broadsides for. Oh, that's so cool. This art she made, it's so good. She's in the audience, so I bet she's embarrassed now. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. And I love all your descriptions of just the backstory behind these. And it's so cool. It makes me wonder, like, is that something you kind of had always known about? Or did you research it specifically for the book? Um, I did a lot of specific research for the book. Um, so I, let's see, I mean, sort of started getting interested in this aspect of conservation when I took an environmental science class and then was invited to tutor the class like next semester because the professor really liked me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it had a lot of like small field work opportunities. And one of those included like a buckthorn removal. And I'm like, this is just really fascinating and learning about the history of like how Minnesota tried to get goats to go eat the buckthorn. and. <laughs> You know, of course, like pesticides are often a last resort um, solution, but uh, but one of the best things was just people with with gloves and shovels. And, um, so then I started like reading more about it and realizing a lot of things I had seen, some things that I had um, sort of even enjoyed seeing that I thought were really pretty were not actually good for ecosystems. Um, like the Norway maple or the purple loosestrife. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the research I did was just started on the DNR website, the Minnesota DNR website, where they, they also conveniently uh, like group them into like aquatic plants, aquatic animals, uh, terrestrial plants, terrestrial animals. So when I wrote the book, I'm like, well, I'm going to make sure to like get a good balance of, of all kinds of stuff so that we can all see our favorite <laughs> favorite problematic species represented. <laughs> I love it. I think I ended up on that website at one point with the image research. Probably, I think, um, I think, oh, this, the, 
my necklace that another friend made the um zebra muscle came from so cool. uh, dnr i love yeah. it <laughs> i love that illustration it might be my favorite in the whole book <laughs> that one is really good um someone asked i'm really interested to know if you have found new plants that interest you it sounds like you did because you are now on the California plants. Yeah. Um, so I moved to California from Minnesota um, after writing this book and before getting it published. So it's very fun to try to market a book about Minnesota when I'm like, Amelia Gorman lives in California. <laughs> um, but it's amazing here. It's very, very interesting and very different. And I love being on the coast. Um, so I've taken a seaweed foraging class that was cool. amazing for like the practical uses of seaweed as well as just knowing how to spot them and ID them, how to safely harvest them. Um, so I'm in love with seaweed. <laughs> Living by the coast has always been one of my dreams. Um, and of course, walking around the redwood forests uh, just all kinds of different things that are not at all what I grew up with in the Midwest, mainly the redwoods, the tallest trees that can easily live to be, a, you know, a thousand years old. So uh, cool. And the ground cover is gorgeous, too. It's just a really neat, neat part of the world. That's awesome. I like that you're out discovering about <laughs> your new place. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. <laughs> Was it? Oh, I just signed up recently for a mushroom, like yeah. a mushroom class, a mushroom, so the That's California the Coast class. <laughs> I think mushrooms are always somehow speculative, and I don't know why they have that, but I just they associate are. them. <laughs> yeah, no, I went to a Jeff Vandermeer reading once, and I asked him, like, can you just talk about mushrooms for a little while? Can you just because talk about I mushrooms? love that you love mushrooms. <laughs> Jeff Vandermeer's like, yes, yes, I can. Yeah. I imagine that's how that went. Yeah, pretty much. That's great. Um, let's see. I think there was another question. Let me go back. Oh, here's a question from Brandon. He says, contemporary science fiction is often used large scale catastrophic examples of humankind's effects on our environment as backdrops for natural dystopia and apocalypse. Since this collection observes some of the other ways in which we impact our future environment and why we do so, did you discover anything instructive about how we can be better stewards of nature? Yeah, I, well, thank you for asking a, a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> I would love to answer this like more in depth, but I'll do the best I can off the cuff. Um, like I said, I think one way is we need to kind of escape this sort of myth and like easy answer. Um, like, oh, the earthworms are good for the garden or like, oh, we need to save the bees. Um, we don't need to do those things. We need to save the pollinators. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, I mean, we can start at home. We can all plant more ecologically sound gardens. Um, for example, I pulled some of these out of my yard earlier today, and these are um, butterfly bushes, and they are very appealing to butterflies, and they have no benefit to butterflies. Butterflies are drawn to them, and they can't eat them, they can't nest on them, they, you know, can't lay their eggs on them. Um, so they're just this kind of wasteful, harmful plant um, that we've been trying to kill forever without without pesticides but we'll see how that goes we just keep cutting it down and it keeps coming back <laughs> oh, no. so you can you can start in a small way but the truth is we also do need to look at at the systemic issues and those are a lot harder and feel a lot more um, daunting yeah yeah i mean i like it's so magical when you do have that like moment where you're like oh my garden is like a part of this larger thing like the other day yeah. i had a caterpillar on my lime tree and i i was like what type of i was like i don't it i didn't even realize it was a caterpillar at first and then i was like oh it's a swallowtail butterfly oh those are great and the we walked outside the other day and 
my husband goes, Holly, 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 come in here. <laughs> run, run, run. Because <laughs> the butterfly had come out and was like flying around our little oh, nice. area. <laughs> like it had just like become a butterfly. Like I it guess. actually made it through the chrysalis. Yeah. Um, and it a was a friend like, of mine was was watching one and unfortunately she captured the exact moment a wasp came in and like sucked the chrysalis dry Uh, which is I mean wasps are important too so it's right it's natural but that would stress me out I'd be like what she was looking Uh, at no (laughs) following this chrysalis and and then saw it preyed on by a by a perfectly reasonable predator (laughs) Yeah, it made me realize I was like, I need more flowers because like I I mostly made an edible edible garden this last year, but I was like, I need some more flowers because if there's gonna be a butterfly, you just need something flower like. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, I really appreciate that because it's hard to it's hard to feel like what you're doing means something, and mm. I like to believe it can. Um, yeah. But we it's, all it's have better to. than not doing it right and we all but we all have to face the reality that like there's this larger society that we're a part of <laughs> so oh uh, yeah um that was such a great question brandon thank you yeah for that. um and someone else asked about the guy with the starlings what's his name oh um eugene shifalin and i will type that into the chat they were wondering where did he get the starlings from? I'm imagining I it was believe, Britain. I, yeah, from yeah, the, um, yeah, England. That's such a wild story. Yeah, I think that's how you spell his name. If you put that into Wikipedia, it'll probably come up. Cool. Yeah, he uh, fa- thankfully he failed to release like seven other species that never took hold, but oh. the starlings hit just the kind of right right situation where they could could explode um continue to put your questions in the chat y'all but i'm gonna ask one um and it was about i know you had a poem in the ursula k Le Guin anthology right yeah and i think that one was sort of nature that anthology seemed to be sort of like nature based also yeah it? lots of people tapped into that that was um climbing lightly through forests and it was edited by um, R. Lemberg and Lisa Bradley. Um, if people want to look it up, it's an amazing book. It's so cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I just, I loved that. And I was wondering if you, you know, just kind of like your Ursula K. Le Guin thoughts, because she's um, kind of our like guardian angel here at IFB. So, <laughs> our, um... yeah, that's good. Yeah, I noticed you had a quote by her on your, I think, one of your little like press blurbs. Um, yeah, she's an incredible author. I think the first book I read by her, I was like 18 and it was Left Hand of Darkness and certainly changed like my my or my understanding of just how ambitious a book could be like just how big and how many things and war and language and gender and sex and and yet still personal um and then everything i've read since i also loved um and i think a lot of people sleep on her poetry which is which is too bad or a lot of her sci-fi fans kind of sleep on her poetry which bridges sort of more traditional poetry and more speculative poetry yes i agree i i love her poetry is like very sort of like quiet and i think that's why people do that like they don't you know like it's she has like poems like one of her poems is about like this wooden spoon that she's used for years and years and is like seasoned and like the perfect wooden spoon and I'm like oh Ursula like I just love that poem yeah you know and I think that's probably like part of it but her poetry is really amazing so I just she's got a yeah she's got another one that's like she's talking about being in the belly of this metal whale and she's clearly talking about an airplane and it has this line um I am my ancestor's sci-fi that I think is one of the best lines ever and shows how she's always thinking about this sort of futurism yeah. even in her her poetry. Yeah. 
Um, someone on Facebook Live asked, did you find it hard to balance describing the beauty of a species versus the horror of their invasiveness? I definitely did. And when, when I got, you know, my print book and I really like sat down with it for the first time since, since the editing process several months ago, I almost felt like I, I wasn't judgmental enough. <laughs> like I was almost, <laughs> I wasn't warning, you know, I wasn't like flashing the warning signals as much as I wished I had because I was having so fun appreciating all the ways these, these things work. Um, they're just so cool. Um, and yet also so problematic in certain environments. Um, so it's a, a major thing. And if I could go back, I almost wish I had been a little little meaner in some of these. A little harsher. Like, come on, humans, but, get it know, together. Yeah. But obviously, you know, plants don't have, you know, their own morality. They're not, <laughs> they don't have agency. Animals don't have that kind of agency. So, yeah. So it is still fun to appreciate all the unique um unique diversity of the world as a whole and the importance of preserving that includes not letting these these out compete all kinds of others in an extinction event um gregory crosby would like to know what is the most frightening story you've ever read oh my god <laughs> that's a good question and so hard oh, I, hate, I hate these most questions so <laughs> I mean, they're like fun to talk about. Um, I can never do most, so I often just do most recent. Um, and I recently read this story, and I don't even remember the author because it's like a very old story. It was in this sort of gothic, like old gothic collection. And it's about this young man who works at a church bell, and he somehow gets trapped underneath the bell while it's ringing this giant iron um, church bell in a bell tower. And he's lying down underneath the, the knocker, whatever it's called. <laughs> and he's having just these kind of horrific, like cosmic hallucinations um, as he's being rattled and shaken and terrified and like, um, That's scary. so I will, I will look that up and get back to Gregory, but that one was scary because it is this very everyday, like event just this job accident that could happen to you and and then just put you in this transcendentally scary place <laughs> love that that's cool um so i was wondering i know that you write fiction to um short stories some um, and i was wondering like how you approach that from a writing perspective um is it a different vibe or does it kind of just work the same way? Or... Um, I like to think I write stories pretty similar to how I write poetry, which means I don't finish a lot of stories. So. <laughs> <laughs> or it's like a lot harder and a lot slower and a lot just like agonizing over the sound of a line, mm -hmm. which I enjoy doing, but it means that my, my story output is slow. But I think it's important, you know, for stories the way I want to tell them to have a very musical, very lyrical feeling to them. So I will just kind of write one paragraph over and over again with, you know, just detail on each individual word the same way I do on a on a poem. And that's why I publish a lot of poetry every year and maybe one story a year or two. <laughs> I feel you. Brandon says, slow story, yeah. output, solidarity. <laughs> I see that. I'm with you, Brandon. <laughs> it's hard. Oh, man. Like, it's hard. I feel you. They're just so much bigger, and they're so hard um, to keep in my head kind of all at once. Whereas a poem, you, I feel like I can, I can feel it. I can have the whole thing memorized as I edit it. So it's this, this thing I can kind of contain. Um, Whereas it frustrates me that like a story I can't contain, so I have to keep going back and cross-referencing. Yeah. Just wait until you try to write a novel. I know. <laughs> it, me. I'm trying to write a novel and I'm over here like, have I you, am a you? poet. I am a poet. I have not. But it means your novel will be beautiful when it comes I hope so. <laughs> we'll see. No, yeah, like it's, that's, it, 
that's the beauty of being a poet is that you always have that word sensibility. So. Um, I think that's most of our questions. Let me see, let me check Facebook. Do you have a My love? Facebook friends. Let's see, <laughs> someone says, do you have a loved native plant animal relationship? Ooh. Not sure what that means. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> um, see. I guess like, are there native plants that kind of rely on other animals and that kind of synchronicity there? Yeah, and that's the the beautiful thing about a kind of healthy nature is there is going to be a huge um, cooperation between between everything that's happening. So. So it means that animals will spread seeds of plants, birds uh, will spread seeds of plants, and, and deer will, and, and bugs will pollinate, and the ugly flies that nobody cares about will pollinate. <laughs> <laughs> and I love them. Um, I absolutely love the banana slug. It's one of my favorite plants. We, they're animals, <laughs> not plants. Um, so, you know, we definitely didn't have them in the Midwest. There's some slugs, but here in kind of the Pacific Northwest, North California coast, I mean, you can walk outside the wrong time of year and banana slugs would just be like falling from the trees. <laughs> and like they range from kind of brown to just bright yellow, like this gorgeous yellow color that you don't usually see on animals. And, cool. um, so I'm, I'm enamored with the banana slug. <laughs> I love that. And they're just, you know, very helpful little like decomposers that that work through all the dead dead forest matter to keep the forest healthy. Cool. I think you answered the question. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite nature poem or pastoral poet? And which poet slash poem got you into writing poetry? Um, let's see, I don't favorite nature poem. I mean, I do love Ursula K. Le Guin, and it was really fun to move not too far from where she lived and sort of wrote a lot of her poetry about, um, like I really gained a bigger appreciation for her poetry after kind of seeing the things she was writing about. So I, I recommend that if people can ever kind of look at what their poet was look their favorite poets were looking at when they wrote it changes everything. Um, and again, like I really favorite is so hard. So favorite recent, um, Jacqueline Suskin is a local poet I recently discovered who's written a lot about um, seaweed and tide pools and things like that. Um, which poet poem got you into poetry writing? Um, my dad, when I was very little, like, got me a couple poetry books because I don't know he thought I would like them or I was sort of expressing interest in like writing you know making up my own stupid stuff um, and he got me a copy of Robert Service the kind of Alaskan Yukon um, gold miner <laughs> Americana very dude bro poet but just the the first poetry book I ever got was was a Robert Service book from my dad, and the like cremation of Sam McGee was the one he really wanted to share with me. <laughs> That's really sweet. Yeah, and also <laughs> unexpected. <laughs> like, take, leave it to a dad, right, to be like, "Here's a book of poems." <laughs> yeah, love here's it. your here's your poem. Got it. Guy getting cremated. That's so great. <laughs> Okay, we all know where this all came from now. It's all clear. Yeah. Thank you, Amelia's dad. Yeah. I love that. Well, I think that is most of the questions that we have. Um, so thank you so much for reading, Amelia, and for your book. And everyone go buy it if you haven't bought a copy yet. On yes, do it. The Amazons Amazon. and all the Amazon, you can, I believe you can even get it at your local bookstore. They can put in an order for it almost yep. certainly. Yeah, you can go to IndieBound um, and order a book through there for your local books bookstore. Um, and yeah, it's just 
it's it's so lovely and we appreciate it and thanks everybody for coming to the zoom i appreciate it yes thank you all it like absolutely made my day to see all of you um all of you show up all of you listen to me you're all really important to me and it was really really sweet of all of you yeah and also thank you to interstellar flight press because they make such good books <laughs> we do our best <laughs> you make beautiful like physically beautiful books and i loved everything i've read from you guys so. thank you